And we're back. That's right. Back in our dentist's waiting room. It's very comfortable in here. Yeah, that's why I hang out here all day. Uh, and I see you, you've chosen the same colors as the room, so you blend in like I, the Predator. I, yeah, yeah. I decided to wear red shirt, so that'll pop on the screen. Oh, I assumed it was a Star Trek reference. No. Actually, it's a reference to the film we're going to talk about today. Red Rocket. Not to be confused with Red Lobster or Red Robin. Is that the place with the bottomless fries? Yeah. Are they still in business? Did they survive the pandemic? No, no, no. I've only been to Red Robin, I don't know, maybe 75 times. Mm -hmm. And uh, and and the, the bottomless fry thing is a scam. Oh. And all my fast foodies out there know this. Um, all the people subscribe to your your food review channel. I, I have a, like like a uh, I have like a chain restaurant review channel. Yeah. Um, it's called Fat Mike Eats. Um, dot com. Fat Mike Eats. Dot com. Check it out. Um, and I go to Red Robin in I don't know maybe forty of the six thousand videos on the channel. Mm. Um, and uh, the bottomless fries. You know they give you like seven or eight fries they're kind of fat like steak fries but yeah. they, they look like it looks like a pile of them there's only probably seven or eight fries um and then like the waitress only comes around one time oh like you literally like you can eat those seven or eight fries in like 30 seconds and then you're like waitress wait uh, wait uh, uh bottomless you know there's no button to press i want them to invent like a life alert just yeah. for more fries or you could say make a special request you know when you bring my meal bring like seven thousand fries, right? Yeah. Well, sir, uh, uh, we have a policy, you know. And then I flip the table and leave, take a dump on the floor before I walk out of the restaurant. I remember hearing about that in the news. I didn't realize that was you. Sadly enough, it was. Mm. Um, it, I slipped on my own fecal matter on the way out. That's all on a security camera. Yeah. It's on YouTube called Fat Mike Slips. Uh, what are we here for today? So this uh, Red Rocket actually came out, some people have already seen it, because it came out in theaters a few months ago, end of last year, mm -hmm. but we didn't go, because you had to go to a filthy, filthy movie theater to see it. Uh, it's, it's, a, it's rarity, you know, we talked about, like, film, like, real filmmakers, you know? Yeah. And, um, and well, this is literally a real filmmaker, because <laughs> uh, the movie was shot on Super 16. Shot on 16 millimeter, so, baby. So grainy. Any, and... Anyone that still shoots on film should shoot on 16 millimeter. If you're not shooting digitally, and, unless you're like, I don't know, a Star Wars movie, they should still shoot on 35, but 16 millimeter is where it's at. I love the look of 16 millimeter. Yeah. Or just, just the grain is heavier than, it's, it's like thicker than uh, 35. Yeah. Like I just, I love that look. Yeah, well, it's a smaller image. So, it, you know, when it's blown up and uh, anamorphosized, <laughs> anamorphic lens. We know the technical terms. We know all the technical filmmaking terms. When, <laughs> when the anamorphic lens is slapped on a 16 millimeter image, it's fucking grainy and nasty. <laughs> and, a, and it make it give, a, I mean, it gives it that documentary feel. And all his movies, I don't say all of his movies, the two that I've seen. Yeah. I can't speak for the other two. Well, Tangerine was shot on an iPhone, and that was kind of the big deal with that movie. Like, oh, feature film shot on an iPhone. And, uh, you know, it looks like a movie shot on an iPhone, but it has a real kind of energy to it yeah. that makes up for it. And I think he used, like, a little anamorphic adapter or something okay. in front of the iPhone. Um, but, yeah, Florida Project and then this, or, yeah, that, that gritty 16-millimeter... But still kind of beautiful. I was really taken with this movie, more even more so than The Florida Project, where it's like this weird balance of grimy real world locations, but really like thoughtfully framed and shot. Mm. Like every all the landscape shots in this movie where there's like every shot has like like industrial parks or like smokestacks and all that stuff is always in the background and it's really like colorful too. Mm -hmm. In a way where it's like I know he uses like a combination of real actors and like not professional actors like real people yeah and that that kind of like uh combining of the two where you're like what's real and what's not or i was wondering about that with like the locations too like the main house this movie's at is like did he just go into that house and film mm -hmm. but then you have like the donut shop which is really like bright and colorful yeah. and it's like did they pick colors for this or was that really there it's um, it, it, it's interesting yeah the the production design because that's why I said documentary feel, because Sean Baker is known for casting 
non-actor actors. And, and you, you go through the actors on this, it's amazing. Also, also rest in peace, the character Lil, played by Brenda Dice. Dice? Yeah, just uh, found out. She died two days ago as of this recording. On Valentine's Day. Yeah. I was like looking up all, who all was in this movie and I was like, oh my God. He, he's known to, and I read some stories about this movie and other ones where he just kind of like finds people mm -hmm. and he just like walks up like the drug dealer, the daughter of the drug dealer. Oh yeah. Um, he saw her walking her dog. And so that I think finding these random weird people it gives it that authenticity yeah. and they're good too. And they're, well, they, they're believable. I think there's like, cause I, I remember Steven Soderbergh made the movie bubble about people that work in a, like a doll factory. And that was completely not professional actors. He just cast real people. And it's like, I don't know. There's like this lack of self-consciousness mm. to their performances mm -hmm. or something. It's really hard to explain yeah. why it works. Cause most of the time you try it, like a lot of people that are trying to be actors and we've auditioned plenty of them, yeah. and they're just awful because yeah. they're thinking about acting. And you cast these real people, and they're just being themselves. Acting is acting like you're not acting. Who said that? Was it uh, Adam Sandler? Acting is acting like you're not acting. So act, but don't act like you're acting, get it? All right. Why don't we try that? I guess he just has an eye for finding the right people. Yeah. I don't know. I wonder it's really how many unusual. people he's gone through where it's like he, he gives them the, his business card and the, and they're he, he'd be perfect. And then, ooh, no. Uh, it's probably a process. You oh, know, sure. You know. I, I, I can only imagine like real actors in L.A. that are struggling to make it. And then they see a movie like this. <laughs> and he just plucks some weirdo off the street. And hey. they're like, God damn it. I'm working in a coffee shop for a decade. <laughs> Hey, they're they're more interesting. I agree. And and the movies that he does are completely like non-judgmental, which is a big part of this movie. Mm. Uh, it, this is a movie plucked right out of the 1970s, in terms of not like the style, of the filmmaking, or anything, but just presenting uh, content and presenting characters as they are, and not holding your hand on how you're supposed to feel about any of it. Yes, yes. it's it's the polar opposite of don't look up. That goddamn Netflix movie, speaking of the Oscars, that was nominated for all the Oscars. And you got the director on Twitter just yelling at people about what the movie is about. Yeah, yeah you, you got to give your audience credit. You got to give your audience um, respect mm -hmm. that they, you put something out there. And you that's what I really liked about this movie. And we're going to get into the plot. Mm -hmm. um, uh, it doesn't tell you how to feel about the main character. And that's the best part of the movie. Yeah. I want to say it reminded me a lot of Badlands. Oh, sure. Like the old, uh, uh, what's his Martin face? Martin Sheen, Sissy Spacek. Uh, Ter Ter Terrence, Terrence Malick. Malick. Terrence yeah, yeah. Malick. It's a, it's a movie from the 70s, and it's about an older guy who courts a younger lady. Yeah, it, it had those, and it had that, and of course, you know, Red Rocket has a like film look, and it, it kind of visually. That's the pacing that same, of an older movie, which I like. That's the pacing, yeah. too, yes. Um, about the premise of this, and we're not going to spoil anything because this is a Mike and Jay talk about, which is a recommendation. We're just kind of. telling you to go watch it. I'm just telling you to watch it, but also maybe not watch it because... I guess if you don't want to deal with uncomfortable, creepy characters it, it, that it, the movie's it, not telling you, this guy's bad. Right. <laughs> if you're not, if you like movies like Don't Look Up and Transformers. <laughs> don't Look Up and Transformers. I don't know, whatever. I'm trying to think of like movies. Don't Look Up is a very important movie, Mike, and the movie makes sure you know that at every step of the way. Leonardo DiCaprio is so important. He's all about climate change, but he has 17 mansions. <laughs> and a private jet. And a gas-guzzling private jet. And, and if yacht. you don't like the movie, that means you don't care about climate change. I'm the director of a motion picture. He's an expert in science. I directed Anchorman. Take me seriously. Jay. That movie, by the way, this is a tangent, but that movie, Don't Look Up, was nominated. Uh, first of all, the Oscars are stupid, and you shouldn't put too much faith in them anyway, but that was nominated for uh, Best Editing, and it is one of the most god-awful, worst-edited professional feature films I've ever seen. Oh, gosh. But the premise of the movie is that Simon Rex plays a guy named Mikey, who was a porno actor uh, who has left L.A. and returned to his hometown, 
podunk hometown in Texas. Uh, he's penniless. He's on a bus. Uh, I, I can't remember if he, I think he was in jail. I don't know why he left L.A. It doesn't really say, but clearly things didn't go well. Yes. Either he lost all his money or blew it all, or he was just on the decline. As, he, as, as the movie goes along and you get to know him better, you could just imagine any number of situations right. that caused him to have to leave L.A. And uh, he returns to his wife, uh, who also was in porn. Um, in the movie, not the actress. Yeah. His, uh, yes. You gotta, you gotta distinct, have these distinctions when you're talking about these Sean Baker movies. <laughs> right, 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 right. Because uh, in real life, Simon Rex did do porn very early in his career. Mm. Uh, that's kind of his scandal. Oh. Was when he was like 18 or 19, he did like some porno videos to pay the rent. And then after that, he started. He, he oh, oh. Oh. I wrote down. Uh, Did you write down the titles of his pornos? No, I didn't. I wrote down. can look them up. He's a jack off of all a jack of all trades. Oh, oh. Uh, actor. This is what uh, actor, comedian, rapper, record producer, and model. Okay. So those are his credentials. Uh, he he had a rap career. Do you know about all this stuff, Jay? I, no, no. There, he, I think he raps in one of those scary movies. He's done so much weird stuff. I'm addicted to coke. He rapped under the name Dirty Nasty. <laughs> uh, do you know that song, My Dick? My Dick. Is that him? The, he, he was produced that and he rapped in it. Oh. There's a guy named Mickey Avalon. And, and, and if, you, if you look up like uh, Simon Rex's rap videos, they're, they're kind of like joke. It's like a joke. And so this guy's done all sorts of weird stuff. Just the guy, I guess, similar to the character. Just someone trying a bunch of different things to make it in Hollywood. He is, <laughs> he is similar to his character, and that's the the, the crux of the movie. Is yeah. one of those like we talked about the the stunt casting, casting real people, mm -hmm. where it's just like, oh, like you could tell they're not actors. Yeah. And Simon Rex kind of blends in nicely. That, that's what I wanted to point out. Is yeah, the 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 balance of real actors with non-professional actors yeah. like blend seamlessly right when it could be like drastically like his wife in this he's estranged from his wife they're technically still married yeah and so that's in the movie he comes back and begs to stay in her house until he gets back on his feet um and that actress like she's perfect mm -hmm. i think simon rex is getting a lot of the attention for this movie but she's great too yeah she um, and she's a professional actor but well she was in one thing but, she, but she's not someone that he found in Texas on the street corner and said, be in the movie. Uh, yeah, well, that's the thing. It's like, yeah, she's not in other things. It's not Brie Larson. You know, well, sure, it's, sure. Where it's like, oh, or, or the worst Sandra Bollocks. Where, you remember, Sandra Bollocks is, is to me is like, like George Clooney. You know, where you, you just know them in, as super famous people. Oh, yeah. And then when, when, when Sandra Bollocks, it plays... Like a hardened criminal released from prison. Oh yeah. I'm like not buying it. I'm like I'm never gonna buy that. I'm never ever gonna buy that. And if you want authenticity in your movie about a hardened woman who just got let out of jail, you don't cast Sandra's bollocks. <laughs> you cast some unknown who looks like authentic and real. Yeah. And that's 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 what's great about this. And that's Simon Rex's character is he's that guy. Yeah. That that we've all met who makes you uncomfortable who talks a but, lot but can be charming can be likable right um when he wants to be and and but thinks he's also more like likable and charming than he really is yes i was thinking of uh the documentary american movie and mark borchard there's an interview in that that's always stuck with me where they interview mark borchard's brother and he's like he really doesn't have any talent he's not good at anything the only the only skill he really has is running his mouth. His main asset is really just his mouth, his talking, and he can be pretty convincing, but what he actually can do, I think that he's just best suited for working in a factory, maybe. He's that guy, and it, it's captured perfectly, where it's not, it's not feeding you the information, it's not telling you, mm -hmm. like, no one's saying behind his back, like, oh, he's a phony baloney. You're just you're just right there in his head. Yeah. And and the only one he's really going to impress is someone very young and impressionable, like a seventeen year old. Right. Which is what the movie's about. It's 
yeah. about grooming this young girl to convince her to get into porn. But not because he thinks it's good for her. No. And, and that's like, you, he is likable at first. And even towards the end, you sort of feel bad, but it's, that, it's just that push and pull mm -hmm. back and forth where you're just like, ugh. Like, he... He sort of pulls the wool over your eyes, kind of thing, you know, where you're sort of like, you're almost tricked by, by his, um, his performance, definitely, but is like as a character almost. Mm -hmm. Where he, now I'm not even talking about the actor; the character is putting on a show, like he's oh he's always bragging to that neighbor about you know the the guy the kid who drives around the car with him. It was also great. I'm assuming non-actor. Non-actor. <laughs> uh, he's, he's always bragging to him, like, and he's trying to like turn him to idolize him, so he could use him. Yeah. It's all these subtle. It's gaslighting. Yes. Like, yes. Um, and it's all these subtle things that he's doing, and he and he changes his persona when talking to other people. Like mm -hmm. he knows his his wife's mother, his mother-in-law, has the power to keep to kick him out of the house. Mm -hmm. So his his persona is completely different around her. Um, he's just like this chameleon esque, like sleazy guy, but it's he's almost so dumb he's not aware that he's that he's a dirtbag. But it's just unforgivable. <laughs> a lot of the a lot of the stuff he does and the stuff he doesn't do. Yeah, because there's a there's a really like kind of like what head turning kind of plot development that happens. Yeah, towards like I don't know the last half hour 40 minutes there's a, an event that happens that is comes out of nowhere comes but of an nowhere. event like that would come out of nowhere and and all he thinks about is himself mm -hmm. uh, and and how it will affect him right lots of attention to detail mm. uh, as far as the look of everything like we said i don't know what was set design and what was real yeah. but his wife's bedroom there's tv just one, it's constantly on. Why would I lie to my mother? Oh, you too, huh? Really? What? You're just gonna turn on me like that after every, I've been mowing the fucking Oh my lawn. God. Even... I've been in situations like that where it's just loud enough where it's obnoxious when you're trying to have a conversation and they're constantly talking in front of this TV that's always on. And the fact that it's a TV on a stand on top of her dresser, yeah, like a living room TV stand. Back in the day, it used to be you put your new TV on top of the old non-working TV mm. during the tube TV days. So I guess this is the, the modern equivalent of that. Just the, the location that that he chose. Yeah, yeah, that house. Yeah. And like I said, all the, the, the stuff in the background of just like this constant industrial parks and stuff. There, there's a there's like a power plant. Yeah. And it just looms over this like little trash. It's called Texas City, Texas. It seems to be every every location they go, you see this yeah. thing in the background. It's just it's it's like the knack for those real real locations. I'm assuming that's a real house. Yeah. Oh I, sure. I, it's just it's just too perfect. The uh, the uh, chair similar to this chair that's kind of in a weird spot in the living room. Yeah. Right by the front door. It's yeah. Everything is gross. Everything is gross, but doesn't like draw attention to it. Right. Uh, same with like the like I mentioned. I love how it was shot. Where I think the temptation when you do something like this, where it kind of has a documentary feel to it, is to more oh, yeah. handheld camera work make it look like a documentary. Right. And he doesn't. It's a wonderful looking movie the way it's shot. When uh, Simon Rex comes in to talk to his wife about the fact that he's going to leave town again, it all just plays out in this one really long master shot. Like it's it's like brilliantly acted. Oh yeah, where he is like he's trying to like kind of start a fight with her, so she'll say get out. Mm -hmm. Like he wants her to, and she just doesn't. So he say won't a word. feel bad about abandoning her yeah, again. He's, he's like trying to pick a fight. He almost has it rehearsed in his head. Do you know what I mean? It's mm -hmm. really good. And like like I said, the fact that it all plays out in just one master. We're not cutting into anything. Right, right. He occasionally, very infrequently, uses uh, zoom lenses, like snap zooms. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Just for this like perfect punctuation. And mm -hmm. it happens just rarely enough where when it does, it's like, it's perfect. It's very 1970s. Yeah. Z invention of the zoom lens. <laughs> <laughs> use it all the time. And his use of color, too. There's like... It doesn't feel like everything feels real and lived in, but some of the, like the the production design and the lighting and stuff feels very almost heightened. Mm -hmm. Like there's parts when the the mom and his wife are like out back smoking, and there's just like this green light 
spilling onto the wall of their house, and it's like, I don't know where that would naturally be coming from, but it just creates a really, like, striking image. I think it's intentional. He's trying to contrast the, the gritty, disgusting nature of that character, and you get sort of like this, this dreamy, colorful like surface yeah. to where it, it it's almost like at odds with each other mm -hmm. had you just said oh this guy's a scumbag uh and i'm gonna shoot all this like really desaturated and gross and ugly and, yeah. and shaky and, he's not and, like rubbing your face in it yeah, like a yeah. like harmony kareen movie like gummo or something sure or, uh, yeah. or a rob zombie movie it's it's almost i mean it's definitely the movies from mikey's perspective so he sort of has this kind of like colorful hopeful glamorous image in his head and that's kind of like, it's reflected in like the, the movie, the way it looks, yeah. you know? And even too, I wanted to point out real quick the, the poster. You know, you could have like Simon Rex, you know, half, half face, uh, smokestack in the background, like yeah. spewing smoke out, like drama. <laughs> but it's done in this retro 80s like looks like, like a boner comedy yeah, yeah like porkies or you know and he's, he's got the donut around him yeah. and he's like whoa like, and 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 that's that's the 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 romanticized version of of the like the sexual component in it you mm -hmm. know because he's, he's from a porn background and and well, he's taking advantage of this 17 year old it's all Ooh. fun it's all fun yeah like, exactly. it's, it's the life it's you know it's it's uh it's the greatest thing ever. And then the reality is in, yeah. in the movie. And I think that was a great contrast, that poster. So certainly, uh, Sean Baker is playing with contrasts. Mm -hmm. And I think that goes in with the look of it, too. It's a 48-year-old man <laughs> riding on a bike, and he's trying to like hit on this 17-year-old girl. Yeah. And, and you're like, is this is gross? Right? Like, what is he doing? What? And then you Why find isn't it. the movie telling me how disgusting this is? Right, exactly. Yeah, where, where's, where's the scary music? Mm -hmm. Like, you know, it, it, are, are this, is this supposed to be cute? And then, then you realize, like, what his ultimate goal is. And then she's so, like, naive oh, yeah. as well. And you're like, oh. And, and that's, that's the nice thing about it. It doesn't hit you over the head. It doesn't tell you how to feel. Uh, but you, you brought a Blu-ray. Why did you bring Oh, yeah, it? I wanted to point something out in this movie. Okay. Because I, I can guarantee nobody else has pointed it out. Uh, I know Sean Baker is a fan of, like, exploitation movies mm. and, like, boutique Blu-ray labels and stuff. In Strawberry's bedroom, it's very distracting because it doesn't fit her as a character at all. But on the wall in her bedroom is a uh, poster for the Severin Films Blu-ray release of Wild Beasts. Mm. This poster is hanging in her bedroom wall. And I know it's just there, probably because Sean Baker likes the label Severin. And I wanted to point this out because it's a movie about... Uh, a, a zoo that their water supply gets infected with PCP and all the animals drink it and go fucking crazy. It's like, why would Strawberry, this little 17 year old girl, have a poster for this in her room? Runway 25 is not clear for your landing. It's closed. Emergency. Well, the girl might. Certainly the wife or the mother in law wouldn't. <laughs> so she was the only one you could squeeze in. Or the drug dealer. Yeah, yeah. But he never goes in the drug dealer's house. No. He's always told to go around go, the house. Go to the backyard. <laughs> go to the backyard. Or they have a little tent and a TV set up. I know. <laughs> those plastic chairs and <laughs> that they just hang out in the backyard. Like, that's that real, like, gritty, like, yeah. this is real. This yeah. is someone's it's backyard. It's not something you would think to do in a movie with, like, redneck characters. Right, exactly. You just have them sitting on the porch or whatever. Yeah. The most, like, generic common thing you see in movies. Put them in their the basement or garage and a yeah. little drug den set up. All these little details. Yeah. Life's sweet, Sophie. Life is sweet. So sit back with your parents or your grandma. Get the whole family around. The whole family, get the kids kids around, everybody around the TV. Pop some popcorn. Turn on your Disney Plus, look for Red Rocket uh, <laughs> streaming now. And, uh, you know, yeah, yeah, get that popcorn. Make sure the dog is there. Are we done? Do you want to go watch Wild Beasts now? Oh, yeah! Do I? Oh, my God. <laughs> <laughs> oh, sweet irony. I, I, the fucking lav mic wrapped around the tripod. I thought I was going, going crazy. I'm like, I didn't have a wired mic on. Why, what am I hooked to?